So despite their awesome military, the Qin Empire does not last very long, and we're really using them here as a segue to the Han. Um, their government, their rule, relies on warfare. Warfare relies on both funding for that army and for people to fight and die in that army. And that hurts the average Chinese person. By 211 BC, um, workers who had been forced to do things like build those roads and dig canals, mutinied. They find a lot of allies and folks who don't like the taxes they're paying and the jobs that are being required of them. People who are kind of descendants from warring states nobles, um, from lots of local military leaders, from lots of influential merchants who don't like the Qin, and they gain thousands of supporters. And it's right around this time that the first emperor dies and a bunch of educated elite join this revolt. Uh, the first emperor's successor commits suicide about three years later. His weak successor's, successor excuse me, surrenders to the Han forces in 206. Um, the nomads, the Jean Nu, end up reconquering old pasture land. And civil war follows. And emerging victorious from the civil war is a former policeman by the name of Lu Bang. Um, he ends up reigning from 206 to 195 BC. He first declares himself prince of his home area of Han, and in 202 declares himself the first Han emperor. Based on what we know about him, he must have been quite a character and a really good leader. Um, there's a story of him kind of demonstrating initial disdain for thinkers, for intellectuals, by peeing into a hat of a court scholar. Um, but he quickly learns that power would be better served through good manners. One of the things he does is he brings Confucian scholars in and he uses them to justify his victory by depicting the people who came before him, the Qin, as cruel kings and ruthless despots. So the Han deny any link to the Qin and instead they embrace, they affirm Confucian ideals about moral and cultural foundations of state power and do this to assume that mandate of heaven. Under the cover of receiving this mandate of heaven, they portray the Qin as evil, um, even while they take the best elements of the Qin dynasty, like their bureaucratic, bureaucratic system. And in reality, they're much like them, they just paint them as evil folks beforehand. The Han lasts for about 400 years, from 206 BC to 220 AD. And under this era, there is a blossoming of peace and prosperity. The first emperor's head really no choice but to create allegiances with the folks who help them overthrow the Qin. Um, Lu Bang does things like give huge grants of land to folks who supported him in terms of the military, but still make sure that all power comes from his ruling family. Members of his family rule lands throughout all of China through their direct power. Um, the emperor appoints governors um, to, administrate, uh, to administer these commanderies. Uh, he creates the role of Grand Counselor, kind of like a modern-day Prime Minister that has a civil bureaucracy, uh, arms of government, of educated people who represent powerful local communities. And especially early on, the Han are very careful not to interfere with those local communities. Instead, they rely on marriage alliances and um, in border communities to expand the territory they control. They don't shake things up. Instead, they try and make life the same for people who live there, just kind of change who's in charge. Um, these folks, if we want to think about when they're in charge, they're in charge around the same time as Rome comes to power. But they've got a much more centralized bureaucracy than Rome ever does. Like the Qin, um, all men have to register for military and government service. They have to pay taxes. But as the Han slowly become powerful, they start doing things like removing their enemies from positions of power, crushing rebellions. And by 106 BC, under Emperor Wu, who is the seventh emperor, there are 13 provinces run regularly by imperial inspectors. They divide those provinces into commanderies. Each of those, just like the Qin, are run by civilian and military officials. They balance each other out. These guys maintain stability over millions of inhabitants from tons of different backgrounds. They collect taxes. 
And one of the most important legacies is they start government schools. That's where local officials get recruited from. And if they're trained in a government school, they're trained to believe government ideology. Emperor Wu found his, founds a college for classical scholars in 136. He expands it into an imperial university. And by the second century BC, it has 30,000 students. It's 30 times the size of Barham College. They study classics to understand how to rule. They study medicine and natural phenomena, things like the role of wind and temperature in transmitting disease. They invent the world's first magnetic compass, which is a little different than ours because it points south. They develop high quality paper, which replaces silk, uh, wood and bamboo strips to write on. And um, within all of this, they develop new ideals and rituals and technological knowledge that all buttresses the Han state. 